Um, welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for joining on this Sunday morning. Um, sorry about the time change. This was originally supposed to be at three o'clock with myself and Azim, but um, unfortunately, Azim can't make it, uh, so and we had to rearrange the time. So I do apologize for that last minute time change. Um, but hopefully today we're going to focus on the FPAS application and try and figure out how you guys can maximize the number of points you get in your application. So that's that's essentially what we're going to be covering today. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Shuev and I'm one of the co-founders of Fight Medicine. Um, and this is what we're looking at. So this is particularly aimed at medical students who are going to be putting in their FPAS application either this year or next year. Um, the deadline for this year is coming up very soon within the next sort of two weeks or so. Um, it, it's a pretty short webinar and will mainly be focused around Q&A at the end. Um, and really focusing on FPAS and some tips. I would say that we've covered the AFP and the SJT in separate webinars. So I'm not going to touch on that too much, but happy to take questions um, if you do have any. And as always, this will be recorded and put up on the website. But feel free to ask any questions, either in the chat or the Q&A, whenever they come to your mind. And of course, at Bite Medicine, not only do we do these live webinars, which we run pretty much twice a week, but we have an online textbook and question bank um, on our website, which goes into a lot of conditions in a lot of depth. Um, and a bunch of the content's also free, so please do check that out. This is an example of our question bank. It's multi-step, takes you right through from investigations to management to pathology, uh, as does the textbook, which is why I think it's, um, it's such a good resource. But without further ado, let's have a look at the application system. So Oriel, if you aren't familiar with it, is the portal through which you will be applying. And this is a website you need to register and you essentially need to find the foundation program. You can search for it and uh, it should be there and you can apply through that. So 2021 recruitment, that the um, the selection has already opened. The application has already opened some point in October, I think. So if you haven't applied and you're in your final year, make sure you get that sorted ASAP. And this is really the main slide. So how does the scoring system work? And this is probably what most of you need to know inside out. So I don't really agree with the scoring system. It's, I think it's a bit stupid, but Basically, you get 50, you get a total of 100 points. Half of those points, 50 points, are made up from your SJT score, which is a bit unfair because it's a one off exam. That's pretty um, variable. And that determines half of your score. That just those two or three hours determines half of your score. Whereas everything else you've done in medical school, right from your publications to your decile, um, to your additional degrees, et cetera, that counts for the remaining 50. So, you know, six years of hard work counts for 50 points. And then two hours of this pretty rubbish exam counts for the other 50 points. But that's the way the story goes. Unfortunately, there's not much we can do about that. And you just have to play the game. So what you really have control over, and what I would say is each point makes a difference. So someone who scores, 80 points compared to someone who scores 82 points, those two points make a huge difference, which is actually why you really need to maximize the number of points you get in your EPM. And that's something which is quite easily doable. Of course, you can maximize your score on the SJT, but that's a, I would say it's quite a variable exam. Um, you can practice quite a lot and still not get quite the score you want, but the EPM is a lot more reliable. You know, you can do things to get publications. You can do things to improve your decile. So I would definitely try and maximize your points on the EPM where possible. So how is it calculated? So I can see some questions coming in and I'm definitely gonna to get to them. Just let me get through a couple of slides. So how is the EPM actually calculated? So your medical score performance 
according to what decile you rank in. So your whatever medical school you go to will give you your decile ranking. Um, so if you come in the top decile, you automatically qualify for 43 points. And if you come in the bottom decile, you'll get 34 points. Um, so that's it, pretty straightforward. Top decile 43, bottom decile 34, anywhere in between you can get, you know, according to your decile, you'll get the appropriate number of points. Additional degrees, you can get another five points. For, for those of you who've done masters, BSCs, BAs, whatever it might be, PhDs, you get five points. And the bit I really wanna focus on here is the publications. So there's a lot of emphasis and a lot of stress placed on publications at medical school and students often get really stressed out about it. But ultimately, you know, it only counts for a maximum of two points. If you can get them, that's really good because as I said, every point counts, but you're better off spending your time, you know, smashing your exams, revising, making sure you come in the higher deciles. If possible, taking a year out to do an additional degree, those will get you more points than the publication will. If you can get a publication, that's an added bonus. There are many people I know who have no publications but got into very prestigious deaneries that they wanted. Um, so don't kill yourself getting a publication, but you know, if you can, it is a nice bonus. So the question is, how many points do you get for these additional degrees? We know how many points you get for your decile, so 34 to 43, depending on what your decile is. But how many points do you get for your degree? So top points, five, if you have a PhD or equivalent, which most people don't, you get four points for a first class degree. So a first class BSc in whatever it might be, or, or a master's. And three points for a 2-1, et cetera. So if you've done some sort of intercalated degree, you're at a massive advantage because you, you're, you know, if you've done an intercalated degree and you've got a 2-1, you automatically get three more points. And what I stress here is pretty much no one or very few people get 50 points, okay? Because it's rare to come across someone who has two publications, come in the top decile and has a PhD. You know, that's gonna be a very, very small number of people. Um, so yeah, that's basically, if you can get, do an intercalated degree, that's great. If you can get a couple of publications, that's great. And obviously the higher you score on your degree, the more points you'll get. Um, and the other point here is obviously it's one point per publication and they must have a PubMed ID, but I'll come on to that. So someone's asked a question, if we're in the lower decile, how to choose deaneries to get a place? So I'll, I'll come on to that. So I said publications must have a PubMed ID. If you do a publication and it does not have a PubMed ID, the publication is worthless. It will not count for any points. If you've, you know, like I said, if it's got an ISBN number or whatever it might be, but no PubMed ID, that publication is worthless in the eyes of the FPAS application. So what that means is before you go into any research or writing any paper, check with the journal you're writing to that you're going to get a PubMed ID. Because if you're not, you're just wasting, you're not wasting your time in the sense that it will be useful later on, but you're wasting your time for the purposes of the FPAS application. Um, so make sure you're an author and it has a PubMed ID. And it's one point per publication. So if you've done a hundred publications versus someone who's done two publications, you get exactly the same number of points. So again, it's about being efficient and knowing what you get points for. You know, if you've done 100 publications, that's great, but you're going to get the same number of points as someone who's done two publications. So just bear that in mind. Again, it's all about focusing your time. Um, you know, if you spend, if you've got two publications, that's enough. Spend your time revising and smashing out your med school exams to get that top decile. Um, someone's asked, is there any difference between first author or co-author on papers? Not in the eyes of FPAS, no. So if you're the first author, the second author, the third author, or the 100th author, if they have 100 authors on the paper, as long as it, your name is on one of, is on the, the list of authors, and you've got a PubMed ID on that paper, 
you get a point. It doesn't matter where you are in that list. And again, the decile, this is the key thing because this has the biggest spread, right? So you can either get 43 points or 34 points or anywhere in between. So this is going to be one of the biggest distinguishers between FPAS applicants, along with the SJT, of course. Some important dates for you. Um, so vacancies published already. You need to register on Oriel. And just a couple of days ago, the application window has opened. And it closes in about two weeks time on the 4th of November. So do not miss that deadline. If you miss that deadline, there's really no coming back from that because you just have to reapply next year, which is a real pain. So please don't miss that deadline. Medical schools will release your EPM score, the one out of 50, which includes the deciles, the publications, et cetera, on the 12th of November. And you need to book in for your SJT towards the end of November. And I believe this year it's going to be sat digitally. Whereas when I sat it, it was a, literally a paper um, exam in a hall. Whereas this year, I believe it's going to be online. Um, and that is in December and January. And that SJT counts for 50 points. We've done a webinar on SJT and we'll probably do a couple more in the build up to the SJT exam. Um, but it is really worth spending some time on that because that is 50 points. That's half of your overall score. And then in March, you find out, March and April, you find out what foundation score you've got into and what specific jobs you're going to have. So that's when it gets a bit more exciting. And again, that's the key deadline. Don't miss the 4th of November. I remember I left mine to the final day. And what usually happens on the final day is the whole system crashes. Um, so I actually, I think some people actually ended up missing the deadline because Oriel crashed. Um, it was just such a stressful time. They had to extend the deadline um, because their system crashed. But don't leave it to the final day. Do it a couple of days before. Um, get it out of the way because almost certainly Oriel always crashes on the final day of a deadline. And it's just really stressful. You'll be on a placement. You're trying to finish off your application. Um, and the system will crash and you just will have no idea what's going on. So get it done by the end of October is my advice. So once you're making your application, you need to rank all of the foundation schools. So the foundation schools um, across the whole of the UK, you need to rank every single one. Um, and that's according to your preference. So for me, I ranked the South London, the South Thames Deanery first, um, because that's the one that was closest to me. And within that, I ranked Guys and St. Thomas's first. So you need to rank all of those options um, in this application. And one of you asked earlier, so if you're in a lower decile, how do you choose to get a place? It doesn't make a difference if you're in a low decile or a high decile, you just rank what you want. And the way it works is if you don't have enough points to get your first choice ranking, you will then be allocated either your second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth choice, whatever it might be, depending on your points. So just rank whatever you want in order. And then depending on your points, you'll be allocated a specific program. Um, so it, it's quite straightforward. So that's what I mean. You're allocated foundation scores in rank order. So let's say you've got 80 points, but you need 82 points to get your first choice. So what Oriel will do is they will reject you from your first choice and then they will assess your second choice. And if you've got enough points to get your second choice ranking, they will give you that. If not, then they will reject your second choice and go down to your third choice and see if you've got enough points to get your third choice, et cetera. So just rank whatever you want in order of your preference and then Oriel will allocate to you your foundation school based on your points. 
So it's quite, it's quite a straightforward system in that sense. And just some general tips and advice before we move on to the q and I can see there's a couple of questions rolling in. Um, collect all your evidence for academic achievement. So in particular publications, make sure you have a PubMed ID. Every application, you need a reference, okay? So, you know, that I think it's two references actually. So make sure you have good relationships with certain people in your, you know, either your placements or your GP placement or actually within your university, your clinical supervisors, et cetera. SJT, as annoying as it is, it forms half of your marks, 50 out of the 100. So really spend some time on it. Start practicing now if you haven't started. And don't leave the application to the last minute because Oriel will almost certainly crash and you will be stressed. It, this was a really short presentation because there's not much to FPAS, but I know a lot of you have questions which I can see. So let me get to them. Um, someone's asked in the chat, do you get ranked based on your total score and just go from top to bottom? Yeah, so you, you get ranked on the score out of 100. So that's your EPM, which counts for 50 points, and your SJT, which counts for 50 points. Whatever you get out of 100, that is what you're ranked on. And then, as I said, Oriel will work, will look at your rank, will look at your preferences. So, like I said, if you've ranked, say, um, guys in St. Thomas's Hospital first, and you need 82 points for that, but you've only got 80 points, then Oriel will move on to your next choice to see if you've got enough points for that, and so on and so forth. So it's a, it's a very simple process. What's the purpose of an academic referee and when do we need to include it in the application? So the academic referee is just there to say that you're a you know normal medical student who kind of knows what they're doing, which is what every academic referee will say. And you need to include an academic referee within the Oriel application, which closes on the 4th of November. So it's all part of that same application. Um, what are the tips for choosing foundation schools, particularly for students applying from overseas who are relatively less aware of the places in the UK? Uh, again, just I most people rank it based on location. OK, um, that's what I did. I live in South London, so I ranked the South London deanery, South Thames first, because I wanted somewhere which is quick to commute to. So you, if you're applying from overseas, you need to think, where am I going to move to? Do I want to live in London? Do I want to live in up north? Um, do I want to go to a deanery which has a specialist stroke unit or a specialist cardiothoracic unit? If so, rank that first. Um, so really the key things to consider are location. And if you have any real specialties that you're really interested in, which a particular deanery has, then rank that deanery first. And again, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter the, you know, you, you, all you need to do is rank your, your first preference first, your second preference second, etc. Oriel will then calculate your score and figure out which um, deanery your score is most appropriate for. So just rank your preferences in order and Oriel will do the rest. That's why it's quite a simple process. So someone's actually made a really good point that I forgot to mention in the in the app, in the presentation that if I just go back. So this preference ranking, it can be changed until the 18th of February. So the deadline for the application to submit the application is the 4th of November, but say in January, you have a slight change of heart and you think, actually, I don't want South Thames as my first choice. I want um, I want Wales as my first choice. So then you can change your, your preferences until the 18th of February. But the point is you must have your application submitted to Oriel by the 4th of November. You can still change your preferences until the 18th of February. So that is correct, uh, Christina. Um, when 
you do Oriel, do you apply for a deanery or the specialty you want? So you apply for the deanery first and then later you'll apply for the, you'll be, so you apply for the deanery first, you'll be allocated to your deanery and then you apply for the programs within that deanery, okay? Where are we supposed to upload our documents to support the extra degree? So it's within the Oriel application. When I did it, they had a supporting evidence page where you'd upload your degrees, et cetera, your PubMed IDs. Does the referee actually affect the application? Um, not really. I've never come across anyone who's had uh, a, a referee who's then messed up their application. It, you just basically need a name and an email on Oriel. Um, you don't need the reference itself. And I've never heard of anyone having an issue with their referee, even if they have bad relationships with people in their faculty. So don't worry. You just need a name and an email on there and just choose someone who's reasonable, who's you know going to give you a half decent reference, but it doesn't need to be anything amazing. Um, let's look at some of the questions in the chat. Uh, so I haven't talked about, someone's mentioned linked applications. I haven't mentioned linked applications just because most people don't use them, but linked applications, if you have a partner, for example, and you want to be in the same deanery with them, you can link your applications with theirs. And what that means is you'll end up at the deanery of whoever got the lowest score. So let's say you know, I link my application with someone else, I get a score of 80 and they get a score of 78. So we end up in different deaneries. I'll end up in the score, I'll end up in the deanery of my partner because they got a lower score, okay? So that's the way linked applications work. Um, And as far as I know, with linked applications, the same rules apply. You can change your preferences till the 18th of February. Um, and beyond that, uh, you can't change your preferences. Uh, can we add publications up to the February 18th? No, so everything in your application is finalized on the 4th of November, except the preferences, which you can change on the 18th of February. So do you rank all of the deaneries in the UK? Yes. So every single one, um, I don't think there's actually that many. There's, uh, I don't know how many deaneries there are in the UK. Probably you guys know more than I do, but from the looks of this, there's 20 deaneries. So it's not a whole, you know, it's not tons and tons of deaneries. Can you explain the priority programs? Yes, I was reading about this. I don't know a huge amount about the priority programs. I don't know if um, anyone can drop a comment in the chat but um, I can read up on it and if you email me, I can tell you a bit more about it. But uh, this is a new thing. It wasn't around when I was applying. Um, there's a few things going on like priority programs. There's like a psychiatry fellowship as well, um, which is slightly separate to the foundation program. Um, to be honest, I don't know a huge amount about the priority program. So I, I do apologize. Uh, do each trust in each deanery have different cutoffs for FPAS and in the trust does your FPAS also dictate what specialties you do so I think I've sort of under, understood that question so yeah you'll be ranked into a deanery you'll be allocated a deanery and then within that there'll be a further element of competition deciding which program within the deanery you get so let's say okay, you've gone for South Thames Deanery, you've got that deanery based on your ranking, then within that deanery, you're really, really keen on working at a particular hospital and you want medicine, vascular surgery and paediatrics, you want that program. So then there'll be another stage of ranking, which says, okay, if you've ranked highly, you'll get the program you want. But if you haven't ranked highly within that deanery and someone else has ranked higher than you and they want that program, they will get that program before you do, if that makes sense. So basically your, your ranking determines what deanery you get into. And then there's a further stage of competition, which determines what program within that deanery you are allocated to. 
uh, how likely are students to not be allocated to any deanery if they fall in the lower deciles? Everyone is allocated to a deanery. Like, uh, I've never heard of someone not being allocated. Uh, there, there is space, as far as I know, for everyone. Um, you may, you know, end up in the middle of nowhere, but you will be allocated somewhere. Even if you've come in the bottom decile with no publications, you scored 10 on the SJT and, you know, you'll still be allocated somewhere. So don't worry, you will have a job. How likely are students, uh, oh, sorry, I just dismissed a question. Um, okay. And just about the foundation program and the academic foundation program, you can apply to both, okay? And with the academic foundation program, I believe you can have two choices. You rank two deaneries only, but you can apply to both the academic foundation program and the normal foundation program. The other thing I didn't mention is some of you may have special circumstances. So you may be the carer to a family member, you know, you may be looking after uh, uh, and someone who's really ill. And in those special circumstances, you can bypass all of this FPAS and you can be allocated to the deanery of your preference if, you're, if your special circumstances are genuine and considered, um, you know, enough to warrant that. So if you do have a particular special circumstance where you think actually I need to be at home with my family or partner or whatever it might be, then you can make a special application for that. Um, and that's listed in the, in the foundation program handbook. So I highly recommend, I highly recommend going to this resource here and reading it because that's the foundation program handbook and that goes into everything in detail listing all of those special circumstances, et cetera. Are there interviews after deanery allocation? There's no interviews for FPAS. There's only interviews for the academic foundation program. Okay, so they're two separate programs and someone's asked, if I apply for the AFP but haven't been accepted, does that basically affect your foundation program application. There are two separate applications. If you completely mess up the AFP application and don't get an AFP job, that does not affect your foundation program application in any way whatsoever. They're two completely separate things and two separate applications on Oriel. Uh, the foundation, the deaneries will not know if you've made two applications, okay? They don't know who you've applied to, what applications you've made. So don't worry about that. Is it possible to get a good deanery, but then not be competitive enough to get the program you want, even if you could have got a program you wanted in a different, less prestigious deanery? Yes, that's possible. So what, what this question is saying is, let's say you've ranked a really prestigious deanery right at the top of your list, but your score is such that you've only just scraped into that deanery. So let's say the threshold for that deanery is 80 and you've got 80.01. So you've just snuck into that deanery. But now that means you're at the bottom of that, of all the applicants who've got into that deanery, you are at the bottom. So you are gonna get, you're not gonna get your first choice jobs basically because you're ranked at the bottom of that deanery. So you're unlikely to get the jobs that you want. You might do, you know, depending on what jobs you choose. You know, if you choose a really unpopular um, group of jobs, then you may well get them. But if you rank at the bottom of a deanery, then you're going to struggle to get the jobs that you want. Um, but what I would say to that is most rotations within a deanery consist of general jobs like GP, A&E, general medicine, general surgery. Nearly every foundation program will have some of those rotations, psychiatry. So that's only a problem for you if you're really after a particular set of jobs like rheumatology or you know neurology or something niche like that. So I wouldn't worry too much about that, but that just depends on your, your personal preference. Um, 
how common is it to get at least one commutable London hospital in South Thames? I'm worried about the location risk and I'll end up in Margate in another far place and no London hospital at all. Yeah, it's, it, that is possible because South Thames is a big deanery. So um, I, I don't know if it's changed since when I applied, but South Thames stretched right from central London all the way to Brighton uh, and also Margate. So then you just need to kind of play the game and because you'll know your EPM by November and you can change your preferences by February, if you feel that your score is not quite suitable, you can always play around with your preferences. And that's the advantage of that. Um, there is a risk that you may end up in Margate and Brighton or something random like that. So that is important to bear in mind the size of the deanery and where you can actually end up within that deanery. Um, because within South Thames, there aren't that many central London hospitals. I think it's Guy's and St. Thomas's, King's College Hospital, St. George's, um, maybe a couple of others. I found my EPM score on the UK FPO website, but have not yet included my publication. Does that mean my score does not yet include publication? I don't quite understand that. Does that mean on, on Oriel you haven't put in your publications? Um, if that's the case, then yeah, put your publications in. Uh, put your publications in because if you haven't put your publications on the Oriel application, then they're not gonna know that you have publications. Um, okay. I think that's all. I've tried to answer most of the questions. I'll give it another couple of minutes to see if there's any other questions which roll in. I hope you found that vaguely useful and please do fill out as always our feedback form. We'll be holding more webinars throughout the week so keep an eye out for our schedule. Um, I'm doing a collaboration with Study Hub, which is a St. George's group on Wednesday, um, looking at the musculoskeletal and in particular the knee examination. Might be a silly question. Oh, that's a good question, actually. Does final year death style not count? No, it does not count. So that's quite interesting, isn't it? So it, it's only up to your fifth or your penultimate year exam performance, which counts. So if you've done really well up to your penultimate year and you completely fail or like not fail but do really badly in your final year exams it doesn't matter because by the time you've applied for the FPAS program you've already submitted your ranking before you even you've even sat your finals exams so final year decile does not count obviously you have to pass you know, if you fail your finals, you're not going to get, you won't get a job. But as long as you pass, that final year score does not count for anything. Um, so that's, it's interesting the way it works. But um, yeah, final year score does not count for anything. Uh, irrelevant to the application, but are there certain skills that foundation year one doctors have to know prior to starting their job, such as cannulation, lumbar puncture, etc. I mean, yes and no. Like, if I'm being honest about the skills that I knew, um, I mean, I probably did like two cannulas at medical school and took blood once and failed, um, and that was pretty much the extent of my 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 clinical skills. So. You should, in theory, be able to do things like cannulas, take bloods, catheters, et cetera. Like the really, you know, the basic clinical skills they teach you at medical school. Lumbar puncture, you don't need to know. Um, you should, what I'd advise is be, be decent at cannulating and taking bloods because you're going to be doing those day in, day out. You know, knowing how to do a catheter is also useful. Beyond that, not really. And even if you are really bad at them, what I would say is you pick everything up in the first month anyway. Um, and everyone is very supportive. So if you don't know those skills and you're not that good at them, don't worry, you're gonna pick it up all in the first couple of weeks. It's a pretty steep learning curve. So don't stress too much, focus on your exams, focus on your EPM, play the game and get a good score before. And that's why I always say be efficient, 
make sure you get a good score before anything, before going to the wards, clinics, before you know learning how to cannulate, make sure your scores are good because that's what's going to get you your good job. When you're on the job, you can learn how to do a ABG, you can learn how to do a lumbar puncture and all that stuff. How many specialties make up FY1? Um, how many specialties? I'm not sorry, I don't quite understand. How many specialties make up FY1? Do you mean how many specialties can you do in FY1? If that's the question, then you do three jobs in your first year fy1 you do three jobs in your second year fy2 um sorry i don't know if that's the question you ask you're asking in the application does the referee have to be a member of the university who knows my academic progress or can i include yeah no it doesn't have to be a member of the university as far i included one of my gp um one of my uh senior gps who i was on placement with he had no idea what my exam marks were and stuff how do we choose the three rotations in the FY1? So once you apply to your deanery and you're allocated to your deanery, you will then get um, a list of all the rotations that they have. And then you, you rank those rotations according to your preference. Is there a limit to how far away from the hospital you can live when you're in FY1? As long as you can get to her your job on time, you can live on the other side of the world if you wish but as long as you can get to the ward at nine o'clock or eight o'clock or whenever, um, whenever your job happens to start, then it's not a problem. Uh, let's see. Can you see those rotations before you apply? Um, so on Oriel, that you might be able to see those applications uh, when I, when I did it, they had a big Excel spreadsheet which had all of the deaneries with all the different rotations on offer. Um, so someone Oriel, you might be able to find that, but often it is quite tricky. Um, but just know that every deanery is gonna have the same set of rotations really. They're all gonna have medicine, surgery, GP, psychiatry, pediatrics. Um, and as I said, if you're really keen on a particular speciality like cardiothoracics, um, which, you know, there aren't that many centers which offer it, then just think about that when you are applying. Sorry if this question is very specific. Uh, the Northern Deanery has an AFP with four months of research in F1 and four months of research in F2. Do you think that clinical competencies can be achieved when someone has eight months less in foundation year compared to, yeah, it's a really good question. So the question is, foundation program has six clinical rotations. The academic foundation program has a couple of research placements, which mean you get less clinical contact. So am I therefore gonna be a worse doctor? Um, that depends on you really, because even during your academic block, often what happens is you'll still be on call. So you'll have four months of research, but every you know, week or not every week, but maybe every other week, you'll be on call for a particular, um, for a particular ward. Uh, so I know, for example, I have a friend who's doing AFP in vascular surgery and he was on call for ENT throughout that whole research block. So you can still keep up your clinical competencies. You're still welcome to go to clinics. You can locum and help out in A and E, etc. So you can keep up your clinical competencies that way. That's really dependent on you. Um, but I, I have plenty of friends who did the academic foundation program and are very, very good doctors, clinically competent. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't stress too much about that. If you're if you're keen on research and you want to do the AFP, do the AFP. You know, don't don't worry too much about your clinical competencies because you you will achieve them. Um, they aren't that hard in the foundation programs, you know, do all of those cannulas, catheters, et cetera. So if you're keen academic, do the AFP. Does it make any difference whether to do a rotation, a speciality that you're interested in pursuing in future? Okay, so the question is, um, if you're interested in a particular speciality, should I do that speciality in my foundation program. So let's say you're interested in ophthalmology, should I try and get an ophthalmology rotation? 
if possible, yes, that will that that may give you a slight edge, a very slight edge, but it's not necessary at all. Um, so, for example, there are a very, very small number of ophthalmology jobs across the country. Um, and if you've done that, that, that might give you a very slight advantage in your application. But then again, there are tons of other ways that you can make your application look good with publications, audits, etc. So try if you can um, to get that particular rotation of the specialty you're interested in. But if you don't happen to get that rotation, it's not a problem. You know, it's not a big deal. So don't, again, don't stress too much about it. Uh, like for example, I'm, I'm doing radiology now. I'm a radiology trainee. I think there are, there's like a very small number of radiology foundation program jobs. I didn't do that. I didn't do a radiology foundation program job, but I still got onto the program that I wanted. So, you know, don't stress too much about it. Uh, good. I don't think there's any other questions. Um, again, I'll, if there are any, I'll stick around for a bit. Can you explain locum jobs? Can you do locum jobs while you are in FY1 and FY2? You certainly can. So a locum job is you get paid per hour. So you have your contracted job, your foundation program job, where you get paid, say, 30, 40,000 pounds a year then that you can do a locum within your hospital as an F1 where you get paid, say, £30 an hour. So if you work 10 hours or a 10-hour shift, you get paid £300. Um, for F1, I think you can only locum in your own hospital, but for F2, you can locum anywhere. Uh, and it's just an additional source of income. The way it works is you can you can sign up to a locum agency or you can speak to your hospital to see what locum jobs they have available. Why do radiologists have a full head of hair? It's uh, a good question. Maybe no stress from seeing patients. Uh, I don't know. What's the salary of an FY1? It depends where you work. So in London, you get slightly more because you get London waiting. So it's roughly, I mean, there's a base salary and then it depends on your own calls, et cetera, but it'll roughly be somewhere around 35,000 uh, pounds in that region of 35 to 38,000 um, pounds. And as I said, if you work in central London, you get another extra one or 2,000 because it's central London and they appreciate the commute and stuff's a bit more expensive. So it's, it, I mean, it, you know, it's not, it's not bad, but it's okay. Is the figure annual? Uh, so you're, no, uh, I mean, you have an annual salary, but your salary will change every four months depending on your rotation. So for example, for F2, when I was doing psychiatry, I earned a lot less compared to when I was doing A&E because in psychiatry, my hours were lower, my on-calls were less. Whereas in A&E, I was working one in every two or three weekends. I was doing, you know, you do a lot of shifts. So your, your salary goes up for those four months. But of course, you over the 12 months, you will have an average salary. Is there any useful website that compares living expenses for each city in the UK? Ooh. I don't know. That's a good question. I imagine that's useful for someone coming from abroad. Uh, I don't know if anyone else in this webinar knows any websites that are useful for comparing living expenses, but I would say if you're coming from abroad, maybe check like house prices, rental costs in each of the cities you're interested in, and that will give you a good idea. Um, of course, London, central London is going to be really expensive. And the further away in general from London you move, the cheaper things get um, but yeah i would say try and look at maybe uh, rental costs or house prices and that will give you a bit of a reflection of how expensive it is because ultimately that will be your main expenditure okay cool i think we'll wrap up there Fill out the feedback form, please, if you get a chance. And I will see you on Wednesday for my uh, clinical lecture on the knee examination. I hope that was useful. I know it's a bit different to what we normally do, but I thought it's quite pertinent given that the FPAS 
is round the corner. If you have any other questions, just drop me an email or you can Instagram us. Um, check out our website, check out our question bank, etc. It'll be really useful for your finals exams. Um, and I hope you all have a lovely Sunday evening. Um, any questions, just drop me an email.